Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Open RAN Security in 5G. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You have joined the presentation listening using your computer speaker system by default. If you prefer to join over the telephone, just select telephone in the audio pane and the dial in information will be displayed. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to, to the panel discussion by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded and you'll receive a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording. And now I'd like to introduce Executive Director of the Open RAN Policy Coalition, Diane Rinaldo. Good afternoon and thank you once again for joining us in another session of the Open RAN Policy Coalition's Roundtable Series Open RAN Security in 5G. My name is Diane Ronaldo, and I'm honored to be joined by a team of experts today who will be taking a deeper dive into network security. The communications industry continues to evolve and progress. And with this evolution comes the latest advances in secure communications. While cyber threats continue to pose risks, consumers need the confidence to know that 5G advancements, including those using Open RAN solutions, have carrier and enterprise grade security. That is why today is one of our most important events to date. And I'm so pleased that we have such a distinguished guest to help kick it off. Here with, here with us today is Mark McLaughlin, the chairman of the board for Qualcomm. Mark is also the vice chairman of the board of directors for Palo Alto Network since June of 2018, following his retirement as the company's chief executive. He joined the company as president and CEO in 2011 and became chairman in 2012. Before Palo Alto Networks, Mark served as president and CEO of VeriSign, vice president of business development for Signio, vice president of business development for GemPlus. And he also served as general counsel of Care Corporation and practice law with Cooley, Godworth, and Crunch. For nearly a decade, Mark has had the honor of serving as a member of the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Board a body that for more than 30 years has brought industry chief executives together to provide counsel on national security policy and technical issues to the U.S. president and national security leadership. He has served two year terms as chairman and vice chairman of the NSTAC. A graduate with top honors from Seattle University, he is also a graduate of West Point Military Academy. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time today. The floor is all yours. Thanks, Diane. I really appreciate the uh, kind introduction and good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are. I really appreciate you having me today for this important topic. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be with you and hopefully provide some informative and interesting remarks to what I'm sure is going to be a great panel session following my uh, my opening here on Open RAN or ORAN, if you let me use that term. Before we get started, I just wanted to note how great it is to see uh, security being discussed by the Policy Coalition and a lot of people. At this stage and development of the rollout of Open RAN and 5G, um, in all the major technology paradigm shifts that I've seen in my career, and probably the same for most of you, security has not been at the forefront. It's been something that's uh, come later on, uh, either by design or by policy or both. So I was really pleased when I saw the April white paper from the coalition that has a lot of really solid thoughts and recommendations on this topic. It's a really good read. It's uh, digestible. It's only four pages long, so I would really encourage you to uh, check it out if you haven't done so yet. Now, as far as kicking things off for you today, I was asked to give some thoughts on security and open RAN and 5G. You know, my comments are really based on my experience and my observations over the last 25 years from a number of things that uh, Diane mentioned I've done. One is the President and CEO of VeriSign, uh, really back in the day, it's kind of like the commercialization of the internet. So going back a ways, and VeriSign ran all things and still does .com and .net. So a very, very core infrastructure uh, part of the internet. So I had an opportunity to see the early days of um, you know .com and .net and the A route and a lot of security issues associated with uh, commercialization of the internet. Also is the uh, CEO and chairman at the Palo Alto Networks, which uh, today is the largest cybersecurity company in the world and still growing very, very quickly. Uh, companies dealt with uh, security in, in network, uh, in cloud, on endpoint, 
um, in all forms and uh, continues to be the leader in the evolution of uh, uh, security, including in 5G as well and um, in Open RAN. So I think um, you'll hear a lot from Palo Alto Networks later on, but some, some of my observations are based on my privilege of having had that position. And then also, as Diane mentioned, I've had the opportunity and the privilege for the last about 12 years to serve on the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Council to the president, which provides direct advice and input uh, to the president um, every year on topics that uh, that he may dictate that uh, deal with national security and emergency preparedness in the intersection of technology. So, you know, had the opportunity to front row seat to see all sorts of things like, um, you know, like, uh, you know, encryption, right? When, when uh, and not that that's not a big deal anymore, but when it was a really big deal, you know, items like that. So, Kind of uh, I've been really privileged to see from an operating perspective as a CEO and some of the major tech trends and then also from a policy perspective, you know, the heart of things in Washington, D.C., a lot of, um, you know, a lot of decisions, a lot of thoughts, a lot of policy issues that have come up over the time, again, with all these large uh, technology trends. So with that, when I was thinking about this topic uh, for today, what struck me was really um, the similarities, not the differences. It's the similarities between this major tech shift and, and Open RAN and 5G, and the major ones that myself and probably a lot of people who um, are listening today or partaking today have been involved with in the last called three decades, right? And that would be the commercialization of the web, e-commerce, desktop, then mobile computing, social media, SaaS, cloud, and now 5G, right? And um, you know, I may have missed one or two, but, you know, it seems about every five years ago or so we get, you know, a big paradigm shift in technology um, with all sorts of issues associated with it, not just the application side, but security um, and then also policy as well. I would think, though, in my experience would say that in all those cases, when it comes to security, we've basically seen tensions at play. Right. And the decisions that get made around those tensions whether they're conscious or not, ideally they would be, and before the fact, have really affected the deployments and the security and the trustworthiness, real or perceived, of those platforms, and then the applications on those platforms and how users interact with them. So while you know, I'm not going to try to be exhaustive here, I'd catalog these tensions at their highest level along the following lines. And one is um, humans versus machines. You know, who do you trust more? That was not really a question before, but now it is with the advent of machine learning and AI, and perhaps quantum computing, right? Um, but humans versus machines, and who do you trust more? Which one makes less mistakes? Can machines bring to the table what humans bring to the table in, in innovation and, and the ability to intuit things? Um, how do you keep up with automated attacks uh, from a security perspective? when you're fighting machines, you know, the, uh, you know, don't bring a human to a, a machine fight, right, kind of concept. But the first one would be humans and machines. And I think we'll see that play out in, uh, in 5G and open RAN. The second is one that's perennial, right? And that's open versus closed systems, or you could call them open versus uh, proprietary systems. Um, you know, there's times in, in when people think that uh, closed proprietary systems are more secure because they're closed, right? And they're harder to hack. There's other times you think that uh, open systems are better because um, they're more distributed, right? And uh, if you take down one portion of it, you don't take everything down. You know, but that's been something that um, that people have been discussed for a long time. And associated with that is this concept of, you know, proprietary vendors versus, versus a, an open system that is designed to increase security and disperse it more. Um, and you can go back and forth in that, right? Closed systems can make a very convenient target. Open systems can make for a very convenient, lots of targets, right? But that's attention as well. Another one is a uh, few versus many vendors. And the concept here is the larger and more consolidated vendor ecosystems enhance security or increase insecurity uh, due to there's less targets to attack uh, due to the innovator's dilemma. You know, can they keep up uh, from a tech perspective? And if they can't, does that open uh, opportunities for attackers? And then also, you know, a favorite one today is um, just who are the vendors, right? And uh, depending on what your uh, national uh, perspective is, you know, some vendors may uh, be real or perceived viewed as insecure. And, um, you know, there's concerns as to whether um, those, you know, vendors have the best interest of the international community in mind, right? So that's one that who's with us, going to be with us for a long time. 
A couple more that tensions that I've seen that I think are going to play out here are um, edge versus central computing, for lack of a better term. And do you protect the edge? Do you protect the core? How important is the core? How important is the edge? Where does compute really happen? Can you take, protect both of them? And if so, what's the right allocation of resources? Um, this is an interesting one because if you've been around for a couple, three decades, right, you, you know, you see the compute moves sent, you know, from the core to the edge, back to the core, in this case, cloud, right now to the edge and with uh, 5G. So this is one that keeps uh, ping-ponging uh, back and forth, but the issue is the same. Another high-level category was going to be privacy and visibility. I'm not going to say security because uh, it's the same thing. You can't secure anything you don't see. So you have to have visibility into these uh, infrastructures in order to secure them. Uh, but privacy is becoming increasingly important um, in that uh, in that there's so much more data being shared, right? So what's the trade-off worth making to enhance security by seeing as much as you can uh, versus the right to privacy, right? And the, the how these uh, systems are designed uh, will impact later on what the ability is to do either of those things. And then just two more. One is uh, of the last two is good, you know, versus bad actors, right? Um, how do you even tell who's a good actor and who's a bad actor in the first place? And then what's the role, if any, for a platform provider, you know, to make those distinctions, right? And in all cases of these major tech trends as well, I think what one of the things we've seen is uh, platforms have been rolled out with great fanfare uh, to positively change the world. And for the most part, they have. Uh, but then the bad guys will always figure out a way to undermine the platform and then use it for less than, uh, you know, less than good causes, right? And then the last one would be um, uh, concept of trust. Trusted versus untrusted users and applications. And this one is, you know, do you trust everyone and everything, which is usually a bad idea, um, or do you go to the other extreme, which is really something that's um, uh, gaining a lot of tra traction today, which would be, you, know, you don't trust anybody or anything, right? This concept of uh, a zero trust. Um, and can you bake that in? at the platform level and ideally uh, sooner and later. So again, that's not meant to be exhaustive, uh, but my point of going through those is I think there's more similarities than dissimilarities uh, as, a rem as a part of all these tech rollouts over time. And I think we're gonna see all these at play, these tensions at play in 5G and Open RAN as well. Now there's a lot of really you know, smart technical people, a lot of really smart policy people who are gonna try to answer these questions. Uh, most of which, by the way, are not answered in legacy systems. Uh, the opportunity here is to get to them earlier uh, so that we're not trying to band-aid things um, after there's widespread rollout of these systems later on. And then we're dealing with the security issues and we're trying to layer on top of uh, the platform's various security band-aids, which, um, you know, really doesn't work that well, right? So getting it right from the beginning, uh, getting these learnings in from the beginning, are absolutely critical to the success and um, you know widespread in this case I mean global widespread adoption of these platforms because ORAN and and uh, 5G have magnificent you know benefits uh, to bring to society. Hopefully we can do that in a secure manner. So without trying to you know uh, resolve all those tensions right that are out there, I did want to make a couple observations uh, which I'll call generalizations and. Uh, as far as generalities go, I think it's generally true, right? Uh, with all these tensions, and and this is the, the way the kind of the world is moving right now, technically. And the trends there that I see are um, machines uh, versus humans moving to machines, right? Um, I think that's inevitable. Uh, it has a lot of concerns around that myself, um, but I think it's inevitable. And when it comes to security, uh, the bad actors are there already and on the bleeding edge of that. So, you know, our ability um, to, you know, go machine to machine, if you will, from a security perspective is um, is in front of us and an opportunity that should be seized in, in developing um, ORAN and 5G technology. So, but the trend I think is definitely to uh, have humans do what they do very well, um, which in security is very finite specific topics and have machines do everything else, which is most of everything. Um, but you put the humans on things they're good at and machines on things that they're very good at, which is very fast compute and problem solving. Um, on open versus closed systems, you know, it seems that the trend is to open systems. Um, I think that's pretty much been the case uh, throughout the history of technology. There's been some 
there's been a few examples of uh, you know very successful closed proprietary systems. You know, like uh, like uh, um, Apple being the you know probably the most famous. Um, but generally, things moving more to open versus uh, closed, and uh, that is clearly you know the O and open right. You know, for ORAN, uh, so to go with more distributed uh, vendors, more open systems, uh, more innovation, right? Um, in the hopes that uh, not just for the core technology, but also also for security. We got a better shot at, um, at keeping up and bringing a lot of innovation into the uh, industry. Um, on the vendors, um, in this case, for sure, uh, there's a push towards many vendors rather than few. I think even before we the pandemic hit us, uh, but certainly from the pandemic, we've seen it up and down the line um, in supply chain everywhere, right? Um, that that more vendors are uh, better, you know, and um, and more geographically distributed is going to be better so that there's less chance that uh, we see in the future what we're seeing like as an example in the semi industry uh, space today the the semiconductor industry space today you know a real supply demand imbalance there um you know and very few vendors right doing uh bringing important technologies to the table particularly the legacy uh, technologies in the chip space that um, really needs to be addressed so um, probably a push to more vendors versus few, which fits right in with uh, Open RAN as far as how the design is anticipated there. Um, on edge versus central computing, I think there's been kind of an inexorable you know, push to the edge over the last 30 years in technology. Like I said before, I think we see, um, th this is an interesting one, right? We see the flip-flop um, or reverse every you know, 15, 20 years or so uh, when uh, more compute power is done at the core uh, because it makes sense, uh, then it's pushed to the edge, like going from, you know, central computing to desktop computing to mobile computing. Um, but then it gets pushed back to the core in some fashion, like cloud computing. Um, and now I'm getting pushed back to the edge again with, uh, with 5G because you can do more compute at the edge. So from a security perspective, um, I think that's probably the right way to go, you know, more compute at the edge, uh, more protection, you know, at the edge is probably the, the way to go, but that seems to be the trend. On the visibility and privacy, um, I think more visibility is also something that's just going to happen, right? The technology's there. Um, the issue is going to be about what's the level of abstraction on what you see uh, so that the privacy concerns can be addressed. And, um, and I believe that that's, you know, if you read this paper being thought of in, uh, in 5G and ORAN as well. Um, but I think the trend really is going to be uh, into more visibility, uh, but at an abstracted layer of the data. And then lastly, on the trust, you trust nobody, trust everybody. Um, I can tell you for sure in security, the watchword right now and what everybody's working towards is what's called zero trust. Um, and that means you don't trust anybody, you don't trust anything. And uh, if you do trust them, you trust them just for this instance of this interaction, then you don't trust them again, right? And um, technically that's possible. It requires uh, a lot of work, uh, but if you can get there, um, you know, with legacy systems, they'll be more secure. And if we take a zero trust networking approach into ORAN and 5G, you know, from the start, I'm confident it'll uh, be more secure. So if all that trending is right, and uh, then I think it bodes well for the security posture of Open RAN and 5G, as it seems like the platform decisions are all heading in the directions that, uh, that I just mentioned. And given that, um, I think as uh, whether practitioners or policymakers, I feel pretty confident that we're going to make better tech and policy decisions, you know, today with this uh, infrastructure rollout than what we've learned in the past. Um, but it won't be perfect. I'm sure we'll be sitting here in, uh, you know, five years time and saying, I wish we'd done some things differently. And from that, though, these learnings continue to build on each other for the next big uh, trend as well, which could be AR, VR, right? Um, AI, we'll see. Uh, but these learnings continue to build each other uh, from a security perspective. And probably the most important thing, which we'll close with here, is the ability to take the learnings that we've seen from all these other major technology paradigms and apply them as we are to ORAN and 5G um, and apply them early, which is what we're doing. And part of this conversation and the coalition and uh, this topic of security being addressed so early on, like I said, in, in what is uh, you know, what is the top of the first inning to use an American baseball analogy of, you know, where this uh, development and rollout is if you take the next kind of 10-year viewpoint. So I don't know if that's helpful or not. I hope it is. Uh, there's been some of the things that I've seen over time and how I view ORAN and, and 5G from a security perspective. I really want to thank you for giving me uh, some time this morning to be with you. I hope you have a fantastic session. That's all the lineup 
for your panelists and they're world class. I'm sure you're going to have a great discussion. Thanks so much for the time. Mark, thank you so much for taking the time. That was great. Really enjoyed listening to you. Great. I'm honored to introduce our next speaker via pre taped remarks, my friend and former colleague, the acting administrator of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, Evelyn Ramali. Evelyn comes from a long and distinguished career working for different aspects of government focused on cybersecurity. Since her time at NTIA, she's been able to marry that experience to the telecom world and ecosystem. NTIA is incredibly lucky to have her at the helm, and we are grateful for her leadership and participation. With that being said, please cue the video. Thank you. I want to thank the Open Round Policy Coalition for inviting me to speak and for continuing to offer important programming to improve the understanding of open radio access networks. We at NTIA appreciate the leadership from Diane, Chris, Alex, and others to inform and educate the policy community about the potential of ORAN to improve the resiliency of next generation wireless networks. Understanding how security layers into the ORAN architecture is critical. The Biden administration views 5G security as a high priority. Americans need to be able to trust that 5G equipment and software will not introduce risks that threaten privacy, national security, or human rights. This week, NTIA delivered on a key assignment called for in President Biden's cybersecurity EO. We published a report on the minimum elements of a software bill of materials, or SBOM. The report builds on years of work by stakeholders to develop the concept of an SBOM, which provides information that enhances understanding of the supply chain to those who produce, purchase, and operate software. Though an SBOM won't solve all software security problems, it can form a foundational data layer on which further security tools, practices, and assurances can be built. It is an important complement to next generation wireless networks where cloud and software will play an enhanced role in network design. The Biden administration has identified SBOM as a priority to drive software assurance and supply chain risk management. Our report is intended to serve as a foundation for continued collaboration and public private partnerships to refine and operationalize SBOM work. Another major factor affecting supply chain resilience is limited competition in the telecommunications infrastructure market, which also can contribute to higher prices for operators and consumers in the long run. President Biden last week issued an executive order on increasing competition that recognized the importance of open RAN technology. The order asked the FCC to provide support for the continued development and adoption of 5G ORAN protocols and software, as well as take any other actions that would promote increased openness, innovation, and competition in the markets for 5G equipment. And TIA has been working closely with the FCC and many others to build support for the potential of ORAN. The major lesson so far in the 5G era is that collaboration and trust are more important than ever. All of our goals from promoting innovation to increasing security work best within strong partnerships across government and with industry. At NTIA, the National Strategy to Secure 5G Implementation Plan guides our work to ensure the development and deployment of secure 5G networks. The National Strategy to Secure 5G is built around four main pillars. First, facilitate domestic 5G rollout. Second, assess risks to and identify core security principles of 5G infrastructure. Third, address risks to United States economic and national security during development and deployment of 5G infrastructure worldwide. And finally, fourth, promote responsible global development and deployment of 5G. 
a common theme throughout the national strategy and its implementation plan is the promotion of vendor diversity and open architectures. Open and interoperable approaches offer the promise of a future with a wider variety of hardware and software vendors and the ability for operators to disaggregate their networks between them using open interfaces. The U.S. government therefore fully supports industry's development of open, interoperable networks while recognizing the importance of maintaining a full suite of solutions offered by incumbent trusted vendors. And while this effort can and should be industry-led, governments can help to promote open networks and foster the conditions for their successful deployment and growth. International engagement in this area is also a high priority. And TIA's international team continues to engage on open and interoperable networks in a range of multilateral venues. We are also working with our interagency colleagues to engage bilaterally with a range of partners to discuss ways to remove barriers for new entrants to the market and incentivize technology investment in vendor diversity enabling technologies. We are actively engaging with industry and global counterparts to advance progress toward a set of high level principles on this issue. And TIA has also formed a 5G vendor diversity working group to coordinate US government efforts to reduce barriers for new market entrants, increase the diversity of vendors offering 5G network equipment and services, and promote the development of open interoperable networks. The group is working to achieve these objectives through information sharing, messaging development, private sector engagement, and outreach to foreign governments and stakeholders. I would also like to highlight that NTIA's Institute for Telecommunication Sciences in Boulder, Colorado, is exploring the potential of a 5G challenge in collaboration with the Department of Defense. The idea would be to accelerate open interface adoption and the development of the interoperable 5G components with DOD-grade security from a variety of trusted vendors. We hope to share more about this very soon. To be clear, we are not looking to mandate what technology any operator should use or to have governments distort the market. Rather, we're looking to foster cooperation with the private sector and other like-minded governments on research and development, trials, test beds, and capacity building to promote increased choice and more innovation, including through Open RAN. We've done extensive outreach to stakeholders to inform our approach, but we would still welcome additional thoughts on what our industry partners think should be included and any possible next steps. And TIA thrives on partnerships and collaboration, and we are always looking for new avenues to make progress on our shared goals. Thank you for your time today and enjoy the rest of the webinar. Thank you, Evelyn. And now I'd like to invite the panelist and our moderator on screen for the panel discussion. Hello, my name is uh, Roger Rentner. I'm a founder and lead analyst of Recon Analytics. Uh, I wanna say thank you to, to Diane uh, for inviting uh, me and the distinguished panel uh, that we have here to discuss uh, Open RAN security and in 5G, um, I'll uh, maybe I'll uh, introduce uh, Amy uh, Swariko from from AT and T. Maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and and what you do. Sure, I've been working in security for about 20 years. Um, I've got about 25 plus years in telco in general. Um, I'm I have worked, I'm working currently with both ONAP and with ORAN. Um, I'm on the secure, in securing both of those platforms. Terrific. Uh, we also have on the, the panel Nadrenda, uh, Nagrenda uh, by Campadi from Altiostar. And uh, welcome to the panel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger. Uh, I have over 25, 26 years of experience in uh, the wireless industry, starting from the Nortel days. 
Uh, right now, uh, I'm with RTO Star as the Director for Product Management and Standards, uh, focusing on security. Uh, I'm also uh, uh, recently got elected as a co-chair for the ORAN Alliance Security Focus Group. And uh, looking forward to having a good, good discussion with all the esteemed panels of this year. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we also have Dan uh, Beeman from uh, Palo Alto Networks with us. Thanks, Roger. Nice to meet everyone who's on the uh, event today. Thank you for attending. My name is Dan Beeman. I lead our uh, Palo Alto Networks Global 5G team. Um, I've uh, been in and around the industry for about 21 years, uh, numerous operators and work with, as well as uh, technology partners in the data center. So uh, very excited to be here today and answer some questions around 5G security. Thank you. Awesome. And uh, we, last but not least, uh, Bob Everson from Cisco. Yeah, thanks, Roger, and thanks, everybody, for joining. Really appreciate the time. I'm honored that you're here uh, joining us. Uh, my name is Bob Everson. I'm Senior Director for 5G Architecture at Cisco. Uh, my current responsibilities, our team is, uh, is defining and developing the uh, overall architecture for 5G, uh, leading our open RAN initiatives and a number of other things related. Uh, I've been in the industry for many years as well. Uh, you know, wide-spanning uh, uh, experience from large-scale IP networks, to mobility and, uh, and everything in between. So looking forward to the discussion. Terrific. So thank you for being here. And uh, to the audience, if you have questions, please uh, put them in the in, in the chat box and uh, we'll get to them. Uh, but I'll I'll kick it off uh, maybe with with Amy first, and and then I would introduce uh, other panelists to chime in. So what are the security benefits of 5G in comparison to uh, previous generations of networks. What what would you say, Amy? Amy, you're muted. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now I'm unmuted. Um, really, kind of in a nutshell, I think that one of the biggest security benefits is that the security is being baked into 5G right from the start, and that's that is end-to-end -end security. And um, really having been in the field for a really long time, um, it's a lot easier to enable security when it's there at the start, rather than if you have to go back and retrofit. Uh, there's never money to retrofit, by the way. Um, so I, I think that that's, I think that there are some other things that with 5G has addressed some, some vulnerabilities that were a bit, that were, easier in the 4G and earlier technologies, um, like the IMSI catching, um, there's more home control. And, and just, I think that five, taking the 5G and the fact that we are disaggregating it in the open RAN space, I think that's a, a big help that I think that we're gonna have a lot, as an oper from an operator perspective, we have a lot more visibility into how we are actually securing that equipment that comes from the vendors. Terrific. And uh, Najendra, uh, what, what do you think? Well, actually, there are uh, indeed a number of uh, security enhancements in 5G compared to 4G. Uh, but what I'd like to do is maybe take a slightly broader look uh, at 5G and point out a couple of uh, architectural enhancements, uh, which I believe has fundamentally altered our thinking about uh, security in mobile networks. Uh, the first one I would like to point out is the adoption of uh, so-called service-based architecture in, in 5G core. Now, uh, I guess you know all of us are aware of what exactly service-based architecture is, but in a nutshell, you know what used to be nodes uh, in 4G have have now been converted into something called as network functions, and these network functions offer services, and then these services are accessible via APIs. Now, um, this particular paradigm shift has you know, from a security point of view, what it has uh, enabled is to kind of push the security, which was earlier at the IP layer, uh, up to the transport layer, and then even further up to the application layer. So you you have, for example, in SPA, uh, the way it is done today, you have uh, TLS 1.2 providing uh, security uh, as part, and then this mutual authentication is, is what is basically covered. And then you have authorization in the form of OAuth 2.0. So um, in a way, what has happened is uh, with the advent of service-based architecture, you, you are kind of implementing zero trust where 
these network functions are, are, are responsible for authenticating the other network function which is requesting service and also authorizing based on OAuth. So I think that has been a big learning curve uh, for those of us who have been involved in, uh, you know, defining security for service-based architecture. Uh, the second uh, major architectural shift, which I think we are leveraging and you know and benefiting from in ORAN, is the so-called uh, GNOD-V high-level split, right? Uh, so starting 5G, uh, you have a GNOD-V which is now split into some so-called CU and DU, right? Uh, if 3GPP had not done that, maybe we would not be there in this call today, right? ORAN would not even uh, be uh, existing. So this whole, you know, the disaggregating GNOD-V into CU and, D, uh, CU and DU has also impacted security uh, uh, quite a bit. Uh, what, has, what has now happened is that certain sensitive functions and data have been pushed into uh, the backend, right, to the data centers. Uh, what earlier used to be at the cell site, uh, where let's say, for example, you have your cryptographic keys, right? Uh, th th this has now been pushed back into the data center. So I think that would, that's also, uh, I, I, I see as a big, uh, you know, security feature that has come in 5G, which we are kind of benefiting from. Now, and, and then this was one last feature which I would like to point out is that uh, in 5G, uh, we now have mandatory support for uh, full rate user plane integrity protection, which was not there in 4G. Now, uh, and, and I think, you know, people here already uh, know, know pretty well, having just encryption and, and no integrity protection is no use because a, an active attacker can easily uh, try and figure out and uh, you know do all kinds of mischiefs, right? Uh, so 5G has also introduced user plane integrity protection, which wasn't there in 4G. So in a nutshell, I think these are the three uh, aspects which I wanted to point out: uh, two architectural impacts and then one particular security feature in the form of uh, UPIP, uh, you know, in 5G. Yeah, you know, Roger, I would point out around um, I guess broad concept, Amy hit hit around uh, this as well, but I think it's a more agile disaggregated network. You have the ability to now, um, versus a centralized core and RAN and then a, a closed ecosystem at the perimeter, you now are able to introduce zero trust uh, and, I, and really put that into the cloudification of it at the edge, which is driving a lot of that workload production and the security that you can then isolate within the, the actual network itself, instead of having to worry about what does the rest of the packet core have? Is, is it going to get taken down by a bad malicious a application? You can isolate your traffic. You can really see a lot more of what's going on within that traffic uh, in a 5G network environment and, and be able to scale at, at speed. We've all probably been to a ball game or whatnot many, many moons ago and older technology where you've really struggled for, for where you would perform within the network. And then that security, what's going on in there? Could that take down the entire infrastructure? So that's where security being baked in from the gate is really critical to help the performance. But not only that, apply new new policies and learn from that data and isolate it effectively. In my opinion, sorry. <laughs> oh, great, great. Um, well, maybe we can, Najendra. What what do you think with when it comes to security implication? How will Open RAN increase innovation and and supply a diversity and which hopefully then improves security for 5g and 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 even further down the road for for other advanced wireless networks well uh, you know uh, what open ran has done right uh, uh, in terms of architecture it has introduced additional interfaces uh, it has uh, uh, provided an ability to kind of uh, disaggregate certain control plane functions and then put them in RIC uh, and then be able to manage these uh, network elements through these interfaces. So what, uh, you know, obviously, right, the more interfaces you have, uh, there is always a perception or, you know, and, and rightfully so, that uh, the attack surface has increased. So from my point of view, I think uh, there are obviously uh, vulnerabilities and attack services that we need to address, no doubt about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, with the cloudification now coming into RAN space, you know, which was earlier in, 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 in core, uh, you, and then, and this whole softwareization that is happening, you know, for all the baseband software, I think there is, a better chance that you 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 may be able to detect and manage uh, these attacks, uh, right? Uh, obviously, right. I mean, if you say ORAN, 
completely solves the cybersecurity issue. I think all of us are you know lying there, right? So so what what uh, Oran enables you to do through cloudification is to be able to uh, you know uh, detect vulnerabilities and then plug it sooner, um, eliminate human intervention through advent of uh, AI and ML and so on. Um, one great thing I see about Oran is that uh, by defining these interfaces to every node, uh, you now have an option to track what's happening within that network element, right? Uh, you can only track if there is a, an open interface that you know you, you can you can manage. Um, standardization of the data model is very key because uh, you know whenever you talk about interoperability, you need to have a standard data model. Uh, so in in summation, I feel uh, while uh, you know. Uh, the, the increase in attack surface is there for sure, uh, but then uh, being able, to, you know, being able to disaggregate further into, you know, cell site and an edge data center, uh, cloudification, uh, softwareization of the baseband, uh, ability to deploy, uh, you know, uh, existing best practices and tools from the cloud industry, uh, etc. I think go, goes a long way in not just uh, taking care of the attack services. But also improving the security uh, by you know just by the, by, by the you know by visibility. Uh, so that would be my you know a brief take on uh, Oran security. Yeah, no, thank you. And and Bob, uh, what do you think? Yeah, thanks, Roger. And, and maybe I'll, I'll emphasize a little bit of what Najendra said, and I think Mark said it as well earlier. Maybe I'll say I'll start off saying it a little bit different way. Uh, just because you turn off the lights doesn't mean the cockroaches aren't there. You just can't see them. So when you're dealing with a closed system, I think there's this belief that inherently a closed system, everything's just magically secure inside there. And, and it's not necessarily the case. And what we've seen over history is with open interfaces, when you expose the interfaces to more uh, assessment and scrutiny, and you get this openness, it drives actually more inherent security. Now, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to go completely and say you know that it's automatically going to be more secure because it does take work and security is incredibly important but we have the ability to do that and that's what's actually being done and and the good thing is that with oran we have multiple layers of security that we can implement uh you know the speakers talked on the first question about what's been built into 3gpp with 5g for inherently better security in 5g and i think that's the core of this uh, and then, you know, we have to remember that this is running on IP infrastructure that has been hardened over decades of security assessment and hardening. It's running on cloud software, container systems, and systems that are proven in large scale systems that are tested all over the world and are, you know, arguably the most exposed systems out there. So all of that hardening comes in. And then ORAN Alliance is really stepping up here with uh, the security task group and going interface by interface, uh, you know, everything from the, the O1 management plane, the RIC interfaces, uh, you know, assuring, ensuring that, um, you know, we have the right level of authentication and authorization and then securing the transport and all those aspects there, they're really, really critical to this. So, um, you know, ultimately we are gonna end up with a better secured system and one that has better, better visibility and uh, and for operators and, and everybody else to actually be assured that we have the, the right level of security. Yeah, Bob, I'd echo that and say, you know, I had the luxury of spending some time with Mark McLaughlin over the years. He was our keynote today, obviously, since I'm with Palo Alto Networks. But one of the things I'll point back to that he said once was, you know, um, you know they get asked a lot about other technology vendors in this space and how, how can you, how do you keep up? And I, you know, his answer was really around, um, you know, you I want more of them uh, because obviously the bad actors are not going to stop. And I think Open RAN introduces new technologies and, and us to continue innovating around a standards based approach to apply that security. Like you mentioned previously, where we've got to continue innovating and providing new security solutions within the radio stack. And, and as we we look at now the cloud environment as well and, and to being able to scale for that, it's tremendously important that we have innovation around it and, and instead of a closed ecosystem. So. Um, yeah, awesome point. Great, and and Amy. I think you're on mute, Amy. <laughs> A Amy, thank you. Okay, am I unmuted? <laughs> yes, it's got are. a mind of its own. I keep unmuting it. Um, I would say that I think one of the things that that we shouldn't ignore is the fact that so much of the the five G technology is going to be realized in software. It's not hardware. 
I'm going to do this again as the operator. It's way easier for me to upgrade software than it is hardware. Um, it's as people innovate, uh, as my vendors innovate and come up with new security solutions, come up with with more efficient solutions. I can adopt those very rapidly. I don't have to wait to get my return on investment on a piece of hardware that was delivered a loading dock. I can get I can get a new container from them and I can deploy that into a Kubernetes environment and all of a sudden I get a whole lot more benefits. So I'm gonna be able, as an operator, I can get that more quickly. And the fact that it's open, I can do that innovation myself. There are certain things that operators simply, we really understand about the, the traffic that we see day in and day out. So we can, and, and with Open RAN, the fact that you have this RAN intelligent controller in there and I can deploy applications in there, the X apps and the R apps to do certain types of mon security monitoring, that's gonna give me a, a, a broad range of, of places that I can go to get that, whether it be from Google, me developing myself, or my vendor that I bought, the, that say I bought a component from, is going to deliver it to me. So I just see us being able to move a lot more rapidly than in the past. And uh, Dan, uh, you know, how does Open RAN allow operators to build upon the capabilities enabled by 5G to shift their secure security capabilities? closer to the edge of the network and, and stop attacks closer to the source? So, yeah, that's a great question. So I think around the way the whole 5G network is architected, you have a much more granular level of security, but also a lot of the movement, as you've seen with Mac, with multi-access edge compute, that you've seen with our IoT resources, and then even the way we're going to be able to do a lot more things connecting to the network which means a lot more compute resource required at the centralized data center. That puts a lot of stress on the networks, but also I think for us, as we look at the advent of 5G in general, as we, as it grows over the next, you know, however many years until we see 6G, I mean, I, who knows when that will be, but I think the important part is that it's gonna now become not only the bearer, but also a lot of things that are gonna be connecting from an IoT sensor perspective and securing, it's gonna be the standard, right, for how we expect it to be. It's very exciting. But that's going to require a lot of compute resource. And I think moving it closer to the edge and then being able to secure that with the right technologies, with the right partners, and have an open ecosystem that drives that is critical to our success. Although it needs to follow the standards that we can now align to. So it's not a closed ecosystem. It's not perimeter-based as we've seen in the past where you can freely move. It trusts and verifies and it drives new entrance into that at the edge so, so that we can scale at speed, which is something we didn't have in the past. It was very linear. I mean, I came from the, the IP world at the turn of the century, and, and, and I was involved in a lot of that scale and speed and build out of pipes and access. And you always needed a bigger pipe, right? But the great thing with cloud and the ability to put security controls into that and resources into that is you, can, you have an infinite amount of compute resource. So securing that with the right technologies, with the right policies, and being able to provide that granularity and see that, all that traffic and, and act against it too. So it provides rich telemetry for all of us to see and learn around how the network functions and while maintaining security and it is, is, is gonna be very exciting and, and I think um, you know paramount to what should be considered in this environment. So I'm very excited about this. Great, and, and Amy? Yeah, um, I wanna build on that and also bring up one other topic and that's that I think that we can move a lot more of the attack detection very close to the edge of the network. And that comes, a lot of that comes from, from the idea of, of the RIC or RAN Intelligent Controller, putting those, and I spoke on that earlier, but being able to move all of that type of analytics up front to be able to detect things rapidly. I don't have to wait till it's back in my core. I, I catch it at the edge. And, and it makes my core more, more secure. Yeah, and maybe I'll just I'll pick up on that just for a second, Roger. You know, I think uh, so. I think Dan hit on it a little bit about how you can get more granular control in here. And I think one of the things that we're seeing now is actually the potential to secure the network better with a lower cost because you can focus on securing each one of the elements the way they need to. The control plane needs different security aspects than an implementation in the user plane does. And by moving things out to the edge, 
you you lower the, the 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 threat domain, I guess, there, you know, by by narrowing down, you know, and capturing things earlier, and you can focus the security to you know right right solution for the right problem versus trying to kind of broad brush the entire network. And, and as I think Amy talked about, you know, it's really hard to do that after the fact too. So you can build it in from the start. <laughs> Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, I just want to remind the audience again to to type in any questions uh, in the question box. Um, you know, uh, Roger, uh, just uh, I mean, Amy and others made uh, great points. Just had one thought, additional thought, which I also wanted to point out. Um, uh, I think we should not also forget that uh, disaggregation of software from hardware. Uh, and 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 uh, and the ability to increase the compute power on a need basis, I think, also has enabled a lot of uh, new services to be, you know, dynamically brought up at the edge uh, if the operator requires so. Um, I think we should not forget that. So uh, you know, as opposed to a proprietary hardware which is you know custom built by a vendor A, B, or C, uh, just having a COTS based hardware enables you to you know uh, dimension your system on, on a need basis. Thank you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, you know, I want to talk, we, we talked initially a little bit about zero trust networking. Um, uh, Bob, uh, you know, can you explain to us a little bit better what it is and and how it enhances security in an open RAN uh, architecture? Sure, thanks, Roger. You know, uh, zero trust changed everything with respect to security. We went from a world where you would set up a perimeter and then kind of trust everything behind that perimeter to now we trust nothing. You know, everything has to be verified. And that's the way you have to operate in this world today, uh, you know, with with all the different devices and resources. And, and uh, you know, as that expands out, you need to be able to secure all the communication, regardless of the location. Uh, you know, you need to be able to secure it really per session and you need to be able to apply dynamic policy. And that's what Zero Trust has allowed us to do. Obviously, Zero Trust has gotten a lot more attention uh, over the last, uh, let's say, you know, 12 to 18 months from an access standpoint and network access, you know, users commuting. But in the network and in open RAN, it's really important. Uh, you know, 3GPPs embrace Zero Trust on the access side, on the network domain security between elements. It's also, you know, part of the SBA in, uh, in securing between the network functions. Uh, and then ORAN Alliance is embracing that fully as well. And so each one of the elements must actually mutually authenticate with each other so they can verify that before they can actually communicate. And then all that communication goes over secure interface, you know, using these industry best practices that have been hardened in, in other domains for many, many years. So it really is a, it really is a critical aspect. And um, uh, it makes um, it makes the way we do this a lot more straightforward, I, I would say. Right. I'd like yeah. to echo what Bob said about it being more straightforward. Sorry, Bob, if I just trampled all over you. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I really do think that that zero trust does make it simpler because you know the whole idea of a perimeter. I, I think a perimeter is more complex to maintain than just assuming I have to harden something because all right, I've got to harden everything. It becomes much more of a rinse and repeat. I harden everything pretty much, the, I, I follow the same steps to harden it. And I'm not worrying about, oh, did I let this hole through here or is there this gap in my, my perimeter? So uh, it seems daunting at first and, and you get people who are used to the perimeter model of like, well, I have to do that on every element, but that's, that can all be automated and it's and that's where oran comes in to your point mutual authentication it's required between all elements of the open ran um, all elements have to be able to generate audit logs they've got to do you know they they've got to be hardened all of those things but they're built in from the ground up and so it becomes very straightforward okay those capabilities are there to begin with I need to I, I need to provision credentials and then I've got it digital certificates for you know for Mark's stamp date from Verisign um, so I, I think it becomes simpler and I think it is a simpler security model great and, and uh, Nagendra yeah I think Amy and uh, Bob covered quite a bit uh, you know in, in, in the traditional uh, G node B or in, in a traditional architecture, we always thought access network to be untrusted, right? It was just a blanket uh, approach. And then 
uh, you uh, operators tended tended to have a security gateway between uh, on the back end, right, between Zenod B and the core. Uh, but now with this disaggregation coming along, and you have these multiple interfaces, as I think as Amy said, uh, it's essential that we uh, firmly define a trust model. Uh, if it is zero trust, then obviously every element has to uh, you know, uh, implement the required authentication authorization mechanisms. Um, and uh, Amy is very well aware of what's happening in the security focus group. Uh, so we are looking at you know different approaches to implement zero trust, uh, be it at the layer two uh, with the network access control or you know different uh, concepts. So. I think uh, zero trust, uh, what we know about zero trust as in the 5G SPA uh, may or may not directly apply to RAN. Uh, but then, uh, as Amy said, uh, it's always uh, uh, you know um, uh, safer to take a zero trust approach and then work on mutual authentication, having uh, you know uh, trusted pr uh, processor modules to store certificates and so on and so forth. So I think that is very essential if we have to uh, you know, come out, come out of this, uh, um, you know, no trust model, which was there in the traditional days. Okay, and we have a question from from the audience, uh, which <laughs> basically doubles down on on the the topic of no trust. So, how does ORAN and five G improve defense against man in the middle attacks? You know, uh, that doesn't a or does not a, an open system make these attacks easier? Yeah, Roger, I. I... I would argue on that one. So it's that's a twofold question around ORAN and then 5G improving defense against man middle attacks. I think um, one, I'd say it makes it harder, not easier, because you're going to introduce new technology vendors that are going to be able to um, be in the actual uh, at the edge in the in the open RAN system. But but where a closed ecosystem would you can hide around or maybe not necessarily apply the same security policies that you would have had in a full 5G environment uh, with, with open RAN. Um, so you have more security vendors, you have more technologies that are being able to leverage at the, at the actual edge. Um, I think 5G in general, from the way that it's able to apply security policies and the granularity of it, it gives you a greater access to perform against that than you would have in a, in a traditional environment. I think it's definitely, you know, it's more agile, it moves compute to the edge, and you have, you can, you're able to act quicker on those than you would within a closed environment or a perimeter environment, which we continue to kind of talk on. So um, I don't know if anybody else has any feedback on that one, but. Well, yeah, I think the thing I would add is with the certificate-based authentication, uh, it makes man in the middle much more difficult to uh, to actually implement or, you know, um, because, because you're, you know, going back to the zero trust, uh, you know, every every element needs to be authenticated in there. Every session needs to be authenticated, and so actually, it makes those kind of attacks much more difficult. Right, yeah, I, I yeah I would echo what uh, uh, Bob and Dan talked about. I think the essential point is to be aware of who's who am I talking to or talking with, right? Uh, so that in that sense, authentication is paramount uh, but then of course if someone wants to tap the you know the line and then launch a dos attack nobody can stop it right uh, so uh, to me uh, it's the number one is the physical security measures that uh, one has to take i think we cannot uh, speak more or less about it i think it's important that these critical assets including transmission networks are secure now uh, but does it mean that uh, will, that will handle all the man in the middle attacks? Probably not. Uh, so then you have a different mechanisms like layer two. Uh, you know, when a, when a node plugs into the network, you ensure that it gets authenticated uh, and authorized, and so on and so forth. So I think it's going to be more of uh, um, you know handling it at, at different layers, starting with physical security measures. Right. And uh, so you know what role. Do actually standards play in uh, in 5G security in open RAN, and how how do these standards really drive interoperability and and, and innovation? Uh, maybe you know, Najendra, you can um, put some light on that. Well, typically, uh, you know, in my experience with the 3GPP and now with ORAN, uh, you typically go to standards for two things, right? Uh, either you define uh, an architecture, uh, which is agreed by all the players and you define functions and you know, different things, interfaces and so on. 
Um, and then second, uh, once you define the architecture, you converge on the necessary protocols, uh, security tools, and mechanisms, and so on. Uh, so I think that's how that is the reason why typically we go for standards. Anything which you don't need to interoperate with, you don't really specify as a standard, right? Now, uh, so the question was, uh, what role standards play? Uh, I mean, uh, so we talked about, uh, you know, advent of near time, real time break, we talked about uh, cloudification, so on and so forth, right? But what good is, is it if, if, the, if the architecture doesn't provide me with open interfaces where I can execute these, uh, you know, X apps and R apps and then collect, uh, you know, uh, different metadata, right? Uh, so standards do go a long way in enabling uh, certain important functions uh, that uh, ORAN provides. Uh, which uh, Amy has been very active. So, for example, this interface on O1, right, which connects to uh, uh, the SMO, uh, enables you to do a lot of things, right? Uh, agreement on the data model allows you to do a lot of things, right? So that way, I think standards are essential um, and uh, will always help you in achieving what you are uh, mandated to achieve. So, so Roger, I'd like to build on what Nagendra was saying and kind of go up another level. And that's really that um, the, the standards become the foundation of security in ORAN, but not from the sense of what ORAN is defining itself, but rather that we're building on existing security standards that have been baked and hardened for the last 20 years. We're not trying to re-solve re a problem. So TLS, you know, you've got a huge community, you've, well, not huge, but you have a community there that is making sure that that standard stays secure they they are constantly hacking against it so we're building upon that we build upon ssh similarly um, we're really uh, some of the the netconf security standards we're really building on those so what it does is it frees us up to really apply those standards correctly get the standards defined so that vendors can build to them correctly and and then that gives everybody a lot more space to understand what else they have, what else we have to look at from a security standpoint that maybe isn't covered by a standard. So, you know, some of the RIC and XAP things, but but the interfaces, that should that's kind of out of the box. We should we that's a somewhat solved problem, and I would say it's a very solved problem. Yeah, so, I'd echo, Amy, I'd say it um, to that end too. Operators and industry need to work together around the standards to make sure like over regulation doesn't really help anybody. It's more around developing what has been built previously, but then how do we make sure that it's, you know, being applied with both of our input from industry and, 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 uh, and operators. So and agreed. Go. So, you know, and cipher suites are one of them. Let's just all stay current on cipher suites. <laughs> uh, you know, that's kind of, that's, that's a low hanging fruit. Everybody argues about it, but, but, you know, we argue and yet we agree. Um, so, you know, those are places where we really leverage what's going on out in the industry in general. All right. I, I want to remind the audience again uh, to to pose any questions that you have in the in the question box. But uh, meanwhile, um, uh, Bob, uh, what would you say is the, the role of Open RAN in in speeding up the, the the complete automation of network management uh, to eliminate the security risks that are inherent in in us human uh, having access to to network functions. Yeah, this is it's such an important part of the overall ORAN value proposition. You know, as we move elements, we disaggregate you know hardware from software. We move more of these elements to software. We get this ability to automate the overall network functionality, and there's obviously multiple stages in that, but it is such an essential piece of this and, and uh, one of the big benefits that we get out of, out of ORAN. And you know, one of the benefits there too is, is as we're defining APIs between these different elements, then it's easier to build security controls into those APIs uh, where you know we're, we're obviously less reliant on uh, on manual uh, you know keyboard intervention as well, but those APIs can be secured much more. The communication be, can be secured, and also I think the the remediation can be uh, you know accelerated as well. 
you know, when we get the ability to, you know, we move this to software, we get more automation in, then we're able to, to apply, you know, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence algorithms to better understand what's going on in the network and then have automatic automated remediation. That's where it starts to get really, really powerful and it's way beyond anything that's possible right now. And so I think that's, you know, that's kind of where we're going. Um, and uh, and ORAN is, is essential to that. You know, we, we need to, we have to disaggregate hardware, software. We need to have the open interfaces, all the things that we've been talking about. And then the automation brings all of that together. Great. Um, and maybe not Jendra? Yeah, uh, somebody used the term control plane disaggregation. I don't recollect who it was. Uh, so I think, um, you know, what essentially it means is you, uh, at least the way I interpret is you take a certain set of functions, which was earlier part of, let's say, uh, control plane, um, CU, uh, and then you convert them into X apps, right? Um, so this whole standardization towards that, I think, is what has made ORAN different from the earlier days where you, you still used to have SON and so on, but then it wasn't standardized to the extent that ORAN is doing it now. So pulling these functions into X apps, um, standardizing them, uh, having a standard interface to all the network elements that you would like to monitor through these X apps, also I think has enabled a lot of, uh, you know, like I think Amy talked about, uh, Amy or Bob, uh, Googles of the world, right? Uh, VMware's of the world, right? Who are, you know, who have the expertise to develop uh, these different machine learning models and AI studies and so on, to come in and provide uh, solutions. Uh, so I think that way, uh, it also, I think going back to the question that uh, Roger, you asked, I think it enables a faster automation of network management uh, through, you know, all these different niche players coming into play, which was earlier not there uh, prior to, uh, you know, Oran doing uh, this whole thing about control plane disaggregation. Right. And, you know, it wouldn't be an, an open RAN policy uh, a meeting if we wouldn't have a question around how policymakers can work together with the private sector and, and, and the government and how this all comes together and have a better, more secure digital transformation and how this brings it to 5G. And, and maybe, Dan, you can you can start addressing that I, I think you know what's exciting is that there are a number of different um security working groups within industry standards around gsma with open RAN policy coalition with oran alliance with facebook tip so i think being able to align around that and 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 kind of leads to the question that's in the chat around agility and making sure that you know we're staying current we're going to have a lot of different threats within the network and make, maintaining those standards against it and technology evolves. It's going to require that we're all collaborative and working together and obviously interfacing with the operators and, that are running the networks. So, you know, that's that's really where I see the greatest benefit. Uh, you know, we, we can, we, we all have a lot of knowledge around things and I think a certain way, but I think, um, you know, agreeing on certain uh, tactics to maintain the networks and, and maintaining that, that open dialogue, it comes back to open, right? So you're gonna have an open RAN, you're gonna have an open system where we share data and, and we make sure that we're in alignment on that. So that, that would be my, my input. Great, and, uh... Yeah, we have another question, as as Dan said, in the, uh, from the from the audience, and I think we will uh, we will address that and then close our 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 discussion here. And and the question is like, how do we keep open RAN standards agile in the face of changing threat environments? And I think that's very important because any standard is only good enough uh, as the environment you're in, right? And who wants yeah, to I mean, I think, um, you know, Roger, just one thought on that, too. I think I think it's about we, the, the standards need to be agile, but a lot of this is in the implementation as well. You know, not every problem, not every new problem requires a new standard. And, and one of the things that's important, too, is that we're actually able to sort of shift the problem solving left, as they say, where we can catch more of this in, you know, through a DevSecOps process, where you can actually catch, catch some of this and build some of this in from the start. So the more that we're learning from, you know, from the industry, from the marketplace, 
from uh, you know exploits and things that are happening out there that gets kind of moved in upstream and gets integrated whether it's you know um, you know some of these technologies that have been vetted for for many many years and continue to get honed all of that kind of comes in so the standards process needs to stay agile but a lot of it is about the dev process and that's another great thing about open ran and virtual ran is that you can have a much more agile dev process to integrate uh, you know changes and things that, that need to be made and I'd like to, to kind of weigh in on this a little bit. I think that going back to the fact that much of ORAN will be software, I think that that really gives all of the vendors much better ability to stay agile so that when as the standards evolve and, and ORAN certainly publishes standards, you know, three times a year, three times a year we refresh standards. Um, it gives, because it's in software, vendors can make changes they can push new they can and it's disaggregated so they're not having to send me an entire stack they can send me this particular update this container that runs within a pod they can and so they can re react very rapidly to changes in the standards and that's something we really haven't had before in the telecom space because it's been so tightly tied to closed systems and to very hardware based systems uh, Roger, I just have a couple of points here. One is that uh, I think, as uh, Amy and uh, Bob mentioned, uh, standards are are can be dynamic to an extent, but then that is not the role for you know behind standards, right? As long as we stick to basic security principles of uh, you know CIA, as they say, uh, mutual authentication and stuff like that, uh, you 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 play a big role in deterring these kind of attacks. And even if the attacks come along, you are in a position to detect it and then manage it. So that's one point. And the second point, as Amy mentioned, uh, with the advent of uh, cloud and, and what Bob indicated, uh, with the advent of cloud native uh, concepts into ORAN, Open VRAN, uh, you are now in a position to uh, a, a, you know, protect against east-west uh, attacks, right? Uh, you know, for example, uh, Dan, they, you, know, you have a product on, uh, you know, like for example, enabling virtual uh, firewalls, right? Uh, Cisco might also have it. Uh, so you try to define a micro segment uh, within your uh, uh, compute platform. Uh, and, and then, you know, you, you are now in a better position to detect any of these attacks which might escape through the, you know, the, uh, the perimeter and then come into the cluster. So I think uh, overall, this open VRAN uh, enables us to put together a lot of tools, uh, you know, for early detection and management of these threats if they were to happen. Yeah, Roger. Right. One one final thing before we I know we close out, but I I kind of point back to what Mark said. Um, this is a long game. We've secured other technologies in the past, um, you know, and I think we I'd encourage uh, government officials and. Uh, to, to have conversations with industry and the, and the operators around security technologies so that they continue. This is one great example of how, how we're coming together uh, with this forum and um, just continue that dialogue as things evolve because things are going to continue to, uh, to evolve, you know, have new, new threats, new technologies as, they, as, as we move in this cloud world and 5G world. Right. Well, and with that, I would like to, to thank the, uh, I think, an excellent panel. Amy Aswariko from AT&T, Najendra uh, Bikampadi from Altiostar, Dan Beeman from uh, Palo Alto, and uh, Bob Everson from Cisco. Thank you very much for, uh, for your insight, and thank you very much to, uh, to the audience for, uh, for joining us uh, today for, for this really interesting and important uh, topic. Thank you. And thank Thanks you, everybody. Roger. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. And we'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar, Open RAN Security in 5G. And on behalf of the Open RAN Policy Coalition and our presenters, thanks for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye.